Hello, everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel, Homeopathic Super Sessions by Dr. Jarvis. Today, I'll be doing J.H. Allen, the chronic myosin, Sora and Pseudosora. It's a very, very long chapter, so I've divided it into many parts. So let's see what the first part has in store for us today. The discovery of the chronic myosins by Hanneman came as a great threat to the false concept of etiology of the disease process. So when Dr. Hanneman discovered the theory of chronic disease, this theory of chronic disease posed a great threat to the concept of the cause of the disease, which the allopaths had in mind. The etiology of the disease was accepted before the discovery of chronic myosins, which became a game changer to this concept. So once the, the theory of chronic myosins came out by Dr. Hanneman, or it was discovered by Dr. Hanneman, people started disbelieving in the etiological concept of the disease, and they started following Hanneman's point of view. Hanneman now and again says that Sora was a parent or the basis of every known disease. And it's a well-known fact that Hanneman is saying that Sora is a parent or is a hydra-headed monster, and it covers up all the disease under which mankind grows. Before Hanneman's discovery of lunar disease, the old school was in resonance with Virchow cellular pathology theory. So before the theory of the chronic disease was discovered by Dr. Hanneman, the old school, they believed in the Virchow cellular pathology theory. There were so many followers of the school of thought that for more than 20 years, it formed the basis of the orthodox school of medicine. So Virchow's cellular pathological theory, it formed the very existence of the basis of the orthodox school of medicine. This theory at time went by, was replaced by other numerous theories which were ever changing. So as you all know, during Hanneman's time, there were many, many uh, concepts of disease or oh, there, there, were, there were many pathies and each pathy had its upcoming and each pathy had its downfall. So there were many theories which were there and each theory was replaced by the next theory which came into existence. So therefore, numerous theories were there which were ever changing. Klebs had declared Virchow's theory as indemonstrable and highly improbable. They did not see the hidden vitalism in the cell. So the Virchow's theory was based on cellular pathology. They did not see the vitalism in the cell, that is the vital force. They failed to recognize the theory of vital force due to their materialistic concept. Since they had a materialistic concept, they failed to look beyond that and they did not recognize the theory of vital force. They considered the cell, which was a unit of life, and defined it by different chemical processes or changes present within it. So whatever, uh, the, so the body is composed of many cells and these cell and each cell is a unit of life each has its, has its vital force or each has its own vitalism of in the cell, but they did not recognize this, but they recognize the different chemical processes or the different changes which are present within, within the cell. As a result, those arose, as a result, they arose different chemical therapeutics with this multiplicity of chemical compounds and formula. So as a result of which what happened? The, their pharmacopoeia was based on the chemical therapeutics or the different fermentations and combination of different chemicals given in combination. As a result of which they had a large number of medicines or compounds or formulas to their disposal. This was evident by prescriptions of the medical fraternity. So as you all know, during that time, there were many pathies were there and the chemical compounds and formulas, their prescriptions were seen on the prescription pads of the Orthodox School of Medicine. However, Hanneman did not, however, Hanneman had not done a detailed study of this and found it lacking. That means Hanneman actually here did a detailed study of the Orthodox School of Medicine and he found it lacking. Or he said that it is not correct. The cure doesn't take place. If you read the introduction of Organon, it will become evident. So if you read the long introduction of Organon, about 93 pages are there, in which he has described the etiological concept of the disease, he has given the classification of the disease, and he has given all the different pathies, the advantages and disadvantages, and ultimately 
he has come to the conclusion that homeopath is superior to all these relevant pathies. So please read the introduction, it will give, it will give you a good insight. And he may not only fully understood the unscientific work, working of the system of medicine, but he also was able to know beforehand the outcome of such treatment. So, Dr. Hanneman, being, uh, uh, being a person of deep understanding or uh, being a logician himself, he's, he understood <coughs> that the work which was done was unscientific. And he came to know and he could prophesy or he could prognose or, or he could prognose the case or he could know the prognosis of the case. What would happen if such medicines were given or what was the outcome of treatment? There was no fixed principle in the entire system, be it therapeutic, heterological, or pathological. So, in the orthodox school of treatment, there was no fixed principles. Their system was based on constant changing concepts and uncertainty. So, why there were no fixed principles? Because the basis of treatment or the basis of the system, the system which was based on, it was constantly changing and it had uncertain concepts. Thus, Hanneman had introduced order from this confusion. So, when he introduced a theory of chronic disease or when he introduced homeopathy, such confusion was totally abolished. And in a chaotic world, he bought some, uh, you can say, some, uh, some proper path in which the people could follow. Hanneman had formulated substantial laws which stood the test of time and also formulated the principles on which homeopathy was based. So, as you all know, Dr. Hanneman, he had, uh, he had written the seven cardinal principles and also the, and also the law of Similia. And this to the test of time. And it was on this that homeopathy was based. Now the question arises, why is it necessary to know about the chronic myosins? So uh, Dr. J. H. Allen says that, why is it necessary to know about the chronic myosins? He said, if you prescribe according to the law of Similia, the case should be cured or the case should have been cured. So if you would just follow the law of Similia, Similia and prescribe accordingly, the case, the case would have been cured. The physician should be able to perceive the different myosins and distinguish on SORA, latent syphilis, psychosis, especially the tubercular form. So Dr. J. H. Allen says that in each case, the physician should perceive the different myosins and he should be knowledgeable in order to distinguish the SORIC myosin of the latent syphilis, psychosis, especially the tubercular form, which is a combination of SORA and syphilis. Dr. Harry's remark in the third American edition of the Organon thinks it is not, thinks it is not of importance. Dr. Harry is of the opinion that if the physician accepts or rejects the SORIC theory, and as long as you follow the principles of our great master, Dr. Hanneman, and select the most similar remedy, medicine possible, it will complete the work of so, Dr. Herring also, as he says in the third American edition of the Organon, he also thinks it is a not of importance, or he says that if we would follow the principles of homeopathy, which our great master Dr. Samuel Hanneman has found, and if you select the most similar remedy based on the law of similar, it will do, it will do the work of cure. The last lines of great importance, so long as he selects the most similar remedy possible. When we select the most similar remedy, we understand the way the myosomes act on the organism. So when we select the medicine, naturally, we also are seeing the myosomatic activity of the medicine. Thus, the true similia is always based on the existing basic myosome. So whatever similia we are getting or the similar remedy we are getting, it is always based on the existing myosome. Now, this may be done consciously or unconsciously. Okay, so we may not be conscious at times that when we are selecting the medicine, we are also selecting the myosome behind it and the medicine should also cover up the myosome. So we may be conscious or unconscious about this fact, which is very true. In other words, the curative remedy covers the pathogenesis of the existing myosome. So whatever cure, curative remedy we have found out or the, simil or the similar remedy we have found out, that will cover up the pathogenesis of the existing myosin. We should know the names of the underlying principles which are useful in, in combating the disease. So therefore, also he says that you should also know the myosins which are present as a result of which these myosins 
will be uh, will be uh, responsible for the disease formation. So therefore, we have to identify these myosins. You must also know the law of action and reaction of the remedy is after the remedy is prescribed. So after the remedy is prescribed, you must know its primary or the secondary action. If you don't know this, then how is it possible to watch the progress of the case without a definite knowledge of the disease first? That is the myosin. That means what if you do not know the, the law of action and the reaction after remedy is prescribed, you will not be able to prognosticate the case. The myosins in their mysterious way progress the disease. So now he is given, Dr. G. H. Allen, he has given some functions or some characteristics about the myosin. That means what? The myosins in their mysterious way progress the disease. So each myosin has its own mystery or, or its own action and as a result of which the disease progress. The progression of the soric myosin is different from psychotic, which is different from syphilitic, and which is different from the tubercular myosin. They persist, move forward, pause and, pause and rest. So these myosins, they are always there. They go forward. That means the disease moves forward. At times, it stagnates, and it also takes a rest. That means what? The disease stays as it is, because the myosin, myosinitic activity is not aggravated or it is not it is not moving forward it makes forward movements or retreats and attacks the uh, attacks all along unfamiliar lines so the myosins they have the forward movement or sometimes they move back and they attack the individual on the unfamiliar lines thus we have taken consideration the multiple modes of action so we have to see the different modes of action whether the myosin is moving forward whether it is moving backward whether it is retreating, whether it is attacking, whether it is pausing, whether it is resting, etc., etc. So we have to take into consideration the multiple modes of action. If you do not have a knowledge about the characteristics of an enemy, how will, will it be possible to wage a war against it? So Dr. G.H. Allen says that if you do not know the characteristics of the of our enemy, that means what? You have to know certain features or certain uh, you can say qualities of the enemy, then only we, we will be able to wage a war against it. There are many factors for disease to manifest themselves. So there are many factors for the disease to manifest, them, manifest themselves. We should understand the phenomena of germ development. It could be due to exposure to cold or atmospheric change. Even why should disease return in the same form or different forms? All these questions disturb the mind of Hanneman, which led him to discovery of the soric theory of the disease. So, as you all know, that Dr. Hanneman was practicing for over 30 years and he found out, especially in chronic cases, the disease used to return back. So, therefore, he says, why should a disease return in the same form or different forms? So, Hanneman started thinking about it. He, having a logical mind, he then put up the theory of the chronic disease or the discovery of the theory of the chronic disease or discovery of the soric theory of disease. A true physician is one who perceives the expression of the disease in this myasmatic form and prescribes accordingly. So, Hanneman says that a true physician is one who will see the different expressions of the disease and each expression will have a different myasmatic form. That means each symptom can be represented or can be interpreted according to the myosin present. And accordingly, we have to prescribe. The totality must be considered, especially the values of the totality. So we have to consider the totality of the symptoms and the values. Values meaning what? The myosmatic origin. Thus, the physician looks deeper into the case and identifies the prima corsi morbi. Here, the prima corsi morbi is the myosins. Okay, so Dr. G.H. Allen has said prima corsi morbi is the myosins as a, which are responsible for the diseases in homeopathy. But if you look into the introduction of organon, Dr. Hanneman has said the prima corsi morbi is a primary cause of the morbid disease. That is the materialistic cause of the old school. He, administ he administers anti myosmic treatment. He acts upon the perverted life force. So when it is the totality, naturally whatever remedy he he, uh, he collects or he or, or he gets, it is it will have the myosin behind it. So it will be an anti myosmatic remedy. It will be given or uh, which will act on the life force which was perverted or which was deviated. The results obtained were spectacular. So when he did this, the results obtained were exceptionally good. 
Footnote 107 in the organon tells us that a similar remedy, more powerful in nature, will overpower the disease. This will be only possible if you correctly identify the basic miasm responsible for the disease. So if you could identify the basic miasm which is responsible for the disease, then a similar remedy will is more powerful and it will overpower the disease condition. However, the antipathy school had the materialistic concept in mind and they failed to perceive the vitalistic concept. So again, this is a reminder that the antipathy school, they always believe in the materialistic concept and they fail to look beyond, beyond that, that is the concept of the vital force or the vitalistic concept. If you perceive the miasmatic phenomena, then you will have a complete knowledge about the disease, which is studied through its expression. So Dr. J. Challen says that if you would perceive the miasmatic phenomena, then you'll be able to study the disease through the miasmatic expressions or the disease will, will, uh, will give you the miasmatic hints or what is behind the disease that is the miasm and each miasm has its own expression through the signs and symptoms. Ampels defines definition of disease also acknowledges the activity of the miasmatic influence. Hanneman's proof of the existence of a chronic miasm was seen that when the best diet and regimen was considered the disease again used to return. So the proof was that about the about the about the chronic miasm is that even when the best diet and regimen was considered, the disease used to return. So we are, ex we are excluding the, uh, the exciting causes or the maintaining causes, especially the diet and regimen. This was in spite of correct remedy administered to the patient. So in spite of the correct remedy administered to the patient, still the, the disease used to return. Here, still the disease used to return. This proves that the disease originates within the organism, especially when no external etiological agent was responsible for it. So this proves what? That the disease, it originates within the organism and there are no external factors which are responsible for it. The disordered physiological functions in the organism gives rise to the disease phenomenon. So whatever disordered functions are there in the, within, the organi within the organism, it gives rise to the disease phenomenon. So as you all know, the vital force is in harmony with all the physiological processes in the body and health is maintained. Moment this harmony is disturbed, the disease will set inside. By the use of homeopathic remedy, that is a curative action, the disease disappears with the use of high potencies. And naturally, if you would give the homeopathic remedy by the means of its curative action, the disease will disappear, especially when given in hypotaxis. The disease recedes in the reverse order that it came and finally leaves no trace of the prior existence. So the disease will recede in the reverse order that it came and will finally leave no trace of the prior existence. The disease originates due to some latent inherited internal pre-existing cause which has its habitat within the organism. So again, it reminds us that the disease originates internally in the body because of some inherited, some internal, some pre-existing cause, that is the myceps. It is not connected with any material way except with the dynamic life force. So it has no connection except it has a connection of the vitalistic concept, that is the connection, the myceps in connection with the dynamic life force. So the vital force is dynamic. Similarly, myasms are also dynamic, which act, which act upon the dynamic vital force and it deranges the health. The skin eruptions are never produced upon itself, but are produced due to the poverty changes occurring within the organism. So whenever you get a case of a skin eruptions or a skin disease, they are never produced upon by itself, but it, it is produced because of some changes which are occurring within the organism. So that means there is something going on within the organism as a result of which the skin eruptions are being produced on the body. As a rule, the eruptive disease would cause the disappearance of the whole of the disease, especially when suppressed. So when suppression takes place and when you give the right remedy, what will happen? The return of the original symptoms will be there. So the eruptive disease would again erupt and the disease would be would disappear or the disease would be cured. The skin eruption appears as it tries to, to preserve life and throws out 
and throws out on some non-important part of the body of the skin. So why does this occur? Because in order to preserve life, the vital force will throw it, will throw out the eruptions on some non-important part of the body, like the skin, in order to preserve life. So that's all. So I'll be taking the part two next time. Hope you enjoyed the short video. If you like it, please do give it a thumbs up. If you're new to the channel, please do subscribe. Thank you very much.